Hey, yo, everyone, Andrew here, bringing you another video review, and today we're going to be doing my comic load for the week, as well as questions, answers, news, updates, comments, and anything else that comes to mind. Now, this is the second week of the month, and with that being my favorite week, because there's a lot of Batman, uh, my favorite Batman comic comes out this week which is my favorite comic, as well as a bunch of other comics, some Marvel comics I like, and a bunch of third-party stuff. So um, we might as well just divulge into it and start where we always start, with a little bit of Batman in our life. And we're going to be doing Batman issue number 20. Um, and as with all the Batman issues, I get all the variants, even the digital copy, which I don't use. I just give to my friend. And uh, the variant cover, which I have to say is a really badass cover. Um, at first I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I kept on looking and I said, you know, this is a really good cover. Uh, one of my favorite of the uh, covers from the New 52 that we've had in a while. Uh, so basically this is the second part and the finale to the Clayface mini arc. And it is exactly that. Batman versus Clayface. Well, also Batman's trying to clear his name because Clayface has been going around and pretending to be, well... Bruce Wayne and Batman. Um, and this is something I was kind of looking forward to. We've had two major big story arcs back to back with Court of the Owls, which was a 12 issue story arc, and then um, Death of the Family, which I believe was, what, five or six issues? I think it was five issues story arc, um, including the prelude. And it's nice to have kind of a, a story arc, just two issues to kind of just relax, mellow, let us settle until we get into the next big story arc, which is Batman Zero Year. Uh, so we might as well just jump into the good, the bad, and whether or not you should get it. Good. Uh, first and foremost is I do like the new evolution, for lack of a better term, or redesign that we have with Clayface. It's still very much traditionally Clayface, Basil, Carl, Carl but is also, uh, the, the stuff he can do, he's more evolved, he's more powerful, and it makes him more of a threat. Uh, the dialogue was very nicely done, and I think... It was handled well how Bruce Wayne got out of the predicament that he was in, being framed and all that. Uh, so that was good. Bad, um, a lot of Damian Wayne stuff in there. And I, I like this to be separate from what's going on because there's a lot of Damian Wayne being dead. Uh, it was handled well, but uh, it just feels a little disattached from what you will see in the next issue, which is the Batman and Robin series. Uh, I want to say it's a bad thing, but I do think it breaks up the pace a little. Although seeing Batman flip out at Clayface for making fun of his son was really quite cool, to be fair. Uh, what else? There wasn't really anything else bad. I, I don't want to say this is a momentous story arc or anything like that. It's a nice cool-down story arc, but I'm more than ready for the next story arc that's coming to Zero Year. On a whole, this was a good issue. Uh, I will give it a 4 out of 5. I enjoyed it. And uh, it's nice to see Clayface back in the mold, and great art as always. Scott Snyder knocks out of the ballpark once again. Moving on to the next Batman title this week, and that is Batman and the Red Hood. Uh, this is the five stages of uh, grief, and this is rage and or anger. And basically, Batman is pissed off and he wants to take it out on someone, so him and Red Hood go and take out some evil bad guys. Terrorists, human traffickers, drug dealers, I forget what it is, executioners, bad people. Um, but while this is going on, Bruce is interested to see if there's something, some way, that uh, he can get Jason to figure out how he came back to life so he can bring his son back to life. Uh, of course, Jason doesn't like this because Jason doesn't want to deal with his past. And let's just say, punches are thrown. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Good. Um, I do like how we're hitting all these stages of grief. In addition to that, it was also nice to see him and Bruce kind of just fight at each other and see how Bruce just wants someone to beat him up and to beat the pain out of him. Uh, and Bruce fully tries to do that. Uh, the art was good, and, um, uh, yeah, bad. Uh, one is, I feel as though a lot of the building of a relationship between Jason and Bruce uh, over the past few issues, especially with the Joker stuff, has been ruined or dissolved in this issue because they basically go back to not talking. Spoiler, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, but that's just the gist, is that the, the two of them go back on being bad terms. In addition to that, Bruce hands Jason his guns, and he says, shoot the elbows, knees, but nothing else. Uh, it's nice that they clarify Bruce doesn't want Jason to kill anyone, but it's still kind of, you know, here, here's a baton, why don't you use it in a screamer stick like Dick does or something? Why use a gun? It just seems a little off. Uh, and yeah, Bruce, Bruce seems a little out of character in this. But on a whole, it was a pretty good issue. Um, I would give this a 3 out of 5. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. Uh, I think it was mostly Batman felt a bit out of character. Moving on to Wolverine issue number 3, is it? Yeah, we're on 3. So basically Wolverine and Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Nick Fury Jr. are working together to kind of figure out what's going on with this mystical gun thingamajiggy. Uh, and it kind of takes them to a bar where uh, superheroes go to kind of chillax. That's basically just uh, him and uh, Nick Fury kind of just go around trying to figure things out. While this is going on, Wolverine is contemplating why the Beyonder is showing up and, you know, something disastrous is going to be happening. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, some pretty good action scenes in this. Nice fight at the end. Um, and I do like Wolverine kind of talking about himself, how he's not really a loner, how he likes people. That's kind of just a label that was given to him. So that I do like. Um, bad, nothing really happens in this issue. I don't feel as though the plot moves forward at all. It's just kind of there. Um, I also really don't think that the uh, relationship between Nick Fury Jr. and Wolverine is anything to write home to. It's not bad, but it's, it's just kind of boring. Uh, what else? That's about it. Uh, it does leave off on a good cliffhanger. Uh, on a whole, though, I will also give this a 3 out of 5. It's okay, but okay is just that. Nothing, nothing else. Moving on to Suicide Squad, issue number 20. So, in this issue, uh, basically Amanda Waller is talking to someone in the background. And I'm not going to reveal who the person in the background is, because it's a really good reveal. Uh, but while this is going on, Amanda Waller is kind of testing all the inmates uh, in uh, Bell Reeves, all the Suicide Squad members, in their own different ways. Um, and she's using the Unknown Soldier to do this. Uh, exactly who is now going to be the new member of the Suicide Squad, or at least working with Amanda Waller, and how far is she going to go to control her team? Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Um, I really like the uh, in introspective, I guess would be the right word, the, the psychological look of each character and how Amanda Waller is testing them, uh, from King Shark to Harley Quinn to Death, uh, Deadshot and everyone in between. Uh, I like how she's kind of asserting her strength and also looking at them on a psychological level, getting the uh, imp impression and ideas from this individual. Uh, in addition to that, I do love the Unknown Soldier in this. I, he reminds me a bit of Hush with the mask and everything. Uh, although Unknown Soldier came first, so Hush, you're just going to have to deal with it. But um, I like how brutal he is, and I think he fits well with this team. Uh, bad. Uh, oh, in addition to that, good is uh, I really did like the reveal at the end. Really did. Bad. Um, the, there's no really bad about this. It was, was a really good issue. New writing team. Uh, Alice Knox. Uh, not, I don't know any of his work beforehand, but uh, this is a good start. It is a 5 out of 5. Moving on to Ravengers issue number 12. Oh boy. So uh, shit gets real. Let's just say that. Um, Deathstroke's going around and killing all the Ravengers. But is he killing all the Ravengers? Hmm. I don't know. Um... Deathstroke isn't he has a, a code of honor in this. So you're gonna you're gonna see what happened to every single Ravager. You're gonna find out is Caitlin Fairchild actually Caitlin Fairchild? And this also leads into the Deathstroke issues. Um this should have been done a month ago because this kind of leads into the previous issue of Deathstroke. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Good seeing that this is the last issue of uh Ravagers, I thought it left off on a good note, giving us a chance to have more with the Ravagers. It's not necessarily the end of it. A lot of twists and turns, and it also kind of connects Ravagers to Teen Titans and Ravagers to Deathstroke, which is great. Um, bad? I can't say any. Uh, this was, uh, seeing that this is the end of Ravagers, it is a great series all around, 
and I'm sorry to see it end. It was really a fun ride for the, what, 12 issues that we had. It really was worth it, and it's, it's sad to see a story like this go. It's sad to see a, a series that has so much potential just kind of fall apart. And it's, it's not that it fell apart, it's just not enough um, people gave it a chance. So, 5 out of 5. Ravagers. Moving on to Deathstroke, issue number 20, which I believe is the last issue of Deathstroke. Deathstroke needs to take care of Jericho before Jericho takes care of everyone else. Um, yeah, it's basically a family affair in this. And I'm going to say this. Not everyone survives. Deathstroke makes some hard choices, but choices that he knows needs to be taken to save the world. And who knew Deathstroke would be one of the people to help save the world? Who will live and who will die? Will it be Terra that dies? What about Rose? Or what about, I don't know, Slade's other children, like Jericho? Or the original Ravenger? Uh, or maybe his wife? Or maybe Mr. Majestic? Who knows? It's going to die. You're just going to have to read and see. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good, action is great in here. Moral dilemmas are great in here. Um, really like the utilization of all the characters, and there's some really nice, subtle moments. Uh, that speak so much to who Deathstroke is, uh, as well as big moments that speak to who Deathstroke is, um, and really, really shows what this comic is about and what he is about as a character. So I think that's an important thing. Uh, some sad moments in this too. It's a shame to see Deathstroke end because it's been one of my favorite books of the New Fifty Two. Uh, Deathstroke is one of my favorite characters in comic books, and again. It's tough to see it go like Ravengers, uh, especially when Justin Jordan jumped on. A uh, fantastic run with him. Really has been great, but all the good things have to come to an end. Uh, five out of five. Moving on to Thor, God of Thunder, God Bomb Part 2. So, excuse me if I can't pronounce the guy's name right. The, the God Butcher, Gorg, or something like that. Um, basically, he's trying to create a big bomb that can blow up all the gods and he's stolen Thor from the past uh, to be one of his slaves while Thor from the future and Thor from the present are trying to go and stop the god butcher uh, eventually they meet up with Thor of the past so it's Thor times three versus the god butcher the Thor is gonna come out on top good bad whether or not you should get it good I like how there is a distinct personality between all the Thors from the impulsive, useful one to the um, more heroic uh, present-day one to battle-worn, uh, wiser, older one. I like all the different personality of Thor. Uh, the art was good, and uh, the story was progressed, I think, at a good rate. Bad not enough of Thor's in here. <laughs> uh, no, it was a very much a young Thor uh, centric comic, which is fine because I like young Thor. He's funny. But I think uh, it's, it, it should have been a lot of present day Thor in this too. Um, and the thing is about the villain is I don't like how the God Butcher doesn't realize that he himself is a god. He's just so unlike. I think that's the, the point that Jason Aaron is trying to get to. Is he's trying to make this guy so unlikable. And I just want to see Thor bash his guy's head in. And it will happen. It better happen. Um, on a whole, this is a good issue. I do like Thor. I'm glad I'm continuing the book. Uh, Thor is one of my favorite Marvel characters. He's within the top five. Um, it's hard around here. Um, I will give this a four out of five. Moving on to Superboy, issue number 20. So, Superboy basically teams up with Dr. Psycho in this. And we learn more about Dr. Psycho and his connection to Hive. Um... And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> not much happens in this issue. I feel as though this is kind of a transition. Not a transition issue. Um, this issue feels a lot of the same from the previous two issues ago. When Dr. Psycho first made its appearance. Uh, not too, too much happens in this. Other than the two kind of fighting and kind of working together. Uh, the good is I do like the new adaptation for Dr. Psycho. I like that Hive is being brought into this. Um, and I thought there was some pretty witty dialogue. Bad is not too much happens in this, and in addition to that, um, 
the art changes. And while the art is good, one thing I cannot stand is art changing. It bothers the shit out of me because it really does affect the pace. Uh, Superboy, this go around wasn't bad. It wasn't great. It's a 2.5 out of 5. Moving on to Green Lantern Corps, issue number 20, uh, which is actually an epilogue to the uh, Wrath of the First Lanterns. And this should be released in the fourth week of the month so that uh, it doesn't reveal what happens, which it does reveal what happens to the Guardians. And I'm not going to say, but boy, oh boy. Uh, yeah. Uh yeah, so basically the ending to Wrath of the First Lantern is shown in here even before the ending is actually done. Uh, but this is a healing issue for the Green Lanterns. Uh, for John, for Guy, and for Mogo, too. Okay, who knew? Uh, but this is kind of a healing issue and kind of a nice send-off because no longer will Peter Tomeshi be on this book. We're going to have a new uh, creative crew, which is... Uh, who's the creative team? Robert Vendetti and uh, Van Jensen and Bernard Chang. So, uh, and I'm quite excited the fact that Green Lantern Core is going to be John Stewart's book. So, uh, John Stewart's going to have Green Lantern Core. Hal's going to have Green Lantern. Uh, they're the only real two Green Lanterns having their own titles. Baz is going to be on Justice League. He's still Green Lantern. And then Kyle's a White Lantern on Green Lantern New Guardians. And, uh, Guy is going to become a Red Lantern on Red Lanterns. So I like how they're kind of giving everyone their own kind of flavor and taste. It's not just five Green Lanterns. They're all getting different powers or they're getting different feels to the books. And I think Jon Stewart deserves his own book. He shouldn't need to share a book with Guy Gardner because Jon Stewart is a strong enough character on his own. Um, good. I felt as though this was a nice healing issue. I felt as though it had a lot of emotion behind it. It's a nice send-off for Guy as a Green Lantern. And it ties up a lot of loose ends. And there's, there's nice emotion to this. Bad is I think it was very Guy Gardner-centric. Uh, where I would like to see a little bit more Jon Stewart-ness to it. Uh, and mostly just because Guy is going to become a Red Lantern. I felt as though with that you should put more focus on Jon Stewart. Setting up for the next story arc. Uh, in addition to that, I really didn't like how this spoiled what happens at the end of Wrath of the First Lantern, Green Lantern issue number 20. It doesn't spoil the whole thing, but you see a Green Lantern construct, they're, they're kind of explaining to Sarah, like, all the, what happens. You go, damn, when did that happen? Oh my god, this is spoiling something for me. Um, I was going to give this something along the lines of a 4 out of 5, but because it did give me that spoiler, I'm a little pissed. I'll give this a uh, 3.5 out of 5, Green Lantern Core. Uh, pick it up, but don't read it until two weeks from now. On to Threshold, issue number five. So, uh, Call, and I believe that's how you pronounce the name, C-A-U-L. Uh, Call goes up against Brainiac, and basically Call has a moral dilemma. Does he help out this world that has been bottled up, um, or does he himself leave and wipe his hands clean? Um, the, the, what happens may surprise you. Uh, and it speaks volumes about who he is as a Green Lantern. Uh, good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Good. Thank God this is Brainiac. Thank God that this is the true Brainiac and not the damn thing that we saw in Action Comics. Just a robot, people. That's great. Uh, this is Brainiac at his brightest, at what he should be. I love it. Uh, I like how Call has... a completely different unique character traits to other Green Lanterns and I still consider this a Green Lantern book by every means it even has the Green Lantern New 52 logo uh, to me is still in the part of the Green Lantern universe and um, I like the fact that there's just so much that can be done with this without ever touching the green uh, to the regular DCU um, I felt as though the pacing was well done the dialogue was really fun and the Lafreeze's backup was hilarious as all shit and I'm really excited for the uh, the Lafreeze's new comic that's going to be coming out because it is going to be coming out and it's going to be awesome. Uh, bad Zilch. Uh, Threshold was fantastic this week. Uh, if you are not picking up Threshold, uh, I think you're missing out. It is. It does have a, a slow burn per se, uh, as the slower pace than other comics, but it's still fun, and I think the thing about it that makes it so fun is, is like, 
no expectations or standards set to the characters of the stories. Like, Batman has to be, can't kill, which is important because he shouldn't, but it's like, or Superman must be always truth or justice, or Deathstroke has this code of honor, or Wonder Woman would never do that. Or that. These characters have blank sheets that you can do anything for, and it makes it so much more interesting and fun when shit happens. Uh, five out of five, Threshold, really good this week. Unto Buffy the Vampire Slayer, issue number 21, season 9. Basically, uh, Willow is back, and Willow is trying to save Dawn, but they realize they don't have quite enough magic, so where's one of the few places that still have magic in the world? The Inner Wells, the place where the old ones are buried. However, there is opposition at the Inner Well. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. It's nice to see the team all back together. It's nice to see that they're bringing magic back to the world. And using a lot of the Buffy mythos. Dialogue was pretty good. Uh, and the threat of Dawn dying feels very real. I can actually see this character getting killed off. One thing you have to know about the Buffy universe and Joss Whedon's take on how characters are working. Uh, you can die. It doesn't matter who you are. Main characters die like that. Uh, I think the only characters that will not be killed off permanently... Actually, I can't even say that. Is it Buffy? That's it. Even big all-star characters like Angel and Spike and Willow, they all could have their head on the chopping block at any time. And that's what makes this feel so real, is that we could very well see the end of Dawn. No pun intended. Um, and I think it gives it more of a feel to it. Uh, bad... I can't really say there's anything bad to this. Not quite a 5 out of 5. Didn't blow my mind away, but uh, it was one of the better Buffy issues for this series, and I will give it a 4.5 out of 5. Buffy Season 9, Issue 21. It's good to see Buffy finally getting a stride again. Still not where I wanted Buffy to be, but it's getting better. Constantine, Issue number 3. Uh, so Constantine, uh, the Frost Flame, I believe it's called. The Wizards of Frost Flame, or the... the the spellcast is a frost flame. Um, want that dial. And, of course, who has it? Or who has the pieces of the locations? Constantine. So it's really up to Constantine to make sure this dial doesn't get in their hands. Uh, but what Constantine does, the lies that he puts at risk, and the choices he makes to make this happen, could be a little too extreme. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good, I really did like the story arc. I really do like the, the snow flame. I think it's called the snow flame. The sorcerers of the snow flame. Um, and I do like the situations that were put into for Constantine in this issue. Uh, and the art was really great, as it has been for the past three issues. Uh, the pacing was well done, and I love Constantine as a character in this. A very gray area character. Bad, the story felt kind of short, and I think it could have lasted for maybe two more issues rather than just the first three. Um, however, it was enough to make a bang for anyone who wants to get into Constantine. I'll give this a 4 out of 5. On to Demonite's issue number 20. So this is kind of a healing issue, for lack of a better term. Uh, the Demonites um, are on Themyscira. And while well on Themyscira, they're kind of just recuperating, and they're kind of just getting their bearings back with each other. While at the same time, they believe they found the location to the Holy Grail, which is the uh, Shining Knight's quest. And Shining Knight is slowly getting possessed by the, the vampire-ness of Cain. Um, but uh, they, they believe they found where the location to the Holy Grail is. And what is waiting for them when they get there is a little Cthulhu-ish. Spoiler, spoiler, Cthulhu-ish. Uh, good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, I like the use of the Amazons in this. A lot of the stuff that was set up by Brian Azzarello uh, is used in this. How the Amazons made, to how their culture looks, to how they act. Everything is well handled in this when it comes down to the Amazons. Um, I also do like the art. Um, and I do like the character dynamic between X and the Shining Knight. Um, bad, uh, it's, it feels a lot like a transition issue that wasn't done as well as it could have been. I like the fact that we're moving to the next journey, the next adventure, and that's great. Um, I just don't feel it, really, if that makes sense. Uh, the past few issues, you know, it feels like there's a big threat. With this, it feels like they've always been on the quest for the Holy Grail. Maybe if they, they're like, hey, maybe 
we need this special item to continue our quest for the Holy Grail. But it's just, hey, let's go get the Holy Grail now. It, it's, I don't think there's enough there for the story to just... Am I making sense? Uh, I feel as though there should be more stipulations to the story than just, hey, let's go to this island and go to the Holy Grail. Uh, Demon Knights is always a great comic, but I'm going to give this a 3.5 out of 5. Uh, good issue this week, but not quite up to the Demon Knight-ish standards that it's usually at. Last two issues this week. Katana issue 4. Katana versus the Creeper. Um, and it is exactly that. Katana versus the Creeper. Uh, we get the new 52 Creeper in all of his glory. Uh, exactly what he wants and what he's going to do. Um, and Katana has to deal with the fact that her soul blade, the demon blade, the Miramasa, has been destroyed. And her husband's soul is now free to go about and do what he wants. And he wants nothing to do with Katana. Um, how will Katana deal with this? And how will she deal with the Creeper? Just going to have to read and see. Good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good. Uh, at first I was hesitant about the new look for the Creeper. But uh, in the exterior cover art doesn't really do it justice. But the interior art uh, for the Creeper really does make the Creeper look good. Um, I really do like the new look for the Creeper, and I think it can work in the new 52. Uh, to be fair, Creeper had kind of a shitty costume beforehand, um, and I'm liking this new Creeper. Actually, Creeper's getting his own one-shot, too. Interesting. Mm. Uh, pacing was good. Dialogue was good. Uh, bad. There, were, there was a few moments that felt a little odd, uh, like something was happening I should have known was happening but I didn't know what was happening like when all the spirits gets released a couple of them just fly off and they say things and they do stuff but you're like what's the point of them like there's a little girl that flies into the water and disappears and I feel like she was important to the story but I don't know how she's important to the story maybe it's that she took one of the pieces of the blade I'm not entirely sure they don't really go over it too much. Uh, on a whole, though, this was a pretty good issue. Uh, Creeper, I think... Uh, not Creeper. Should be called Creeper. Katana, I think, is the better of the two comics that uh, Nocenti is writing right now. And Nocenti. Uh, I feel as though she has a better grasp of Katana as a character. Maybe because Katana has less of a character than Catwoman, so it's a little bit easier to develop something that's not there. But uh, I feel as though this was a decent issue, and people that are a fan of the Creeper will... I think, like this because this is a new take on the Creeper. It still feels like the Creeper. He's just a little bit more Japanese Oni than Demon Hell. Still mischievous trickster. And last but certainly not least, Justice League of America issue number three. This ties into the previous issue that we had with Catwoman with her going to Arkham. And a lot of this is setting up them going to Arkham, uh, them finding the robot clones of the Justice League, the regular Justice League, and seeing how the team works together. As well as we also get a backup to Martian Manhunter, which shows a little bit into the Martian's past. Uh, good, bad, whether or not you should get it. Uh, good. I like the fact that this ties into what was uh, previous in the Catwoman issue number 20? No, 19. Um, how she gets captured in Arkham and how she's trying to sneak into the society of supervillains, uh, which is good. I do like how badass that they make the Martian Manhunter look in this. Uh, the art is good and the dialogue is witty and fun. Uh, bad is uh, the... There was one moment that I felt kind of lost. Like, for example, Green Arrow shows up. He's not in on the plan, but I don't realize that he's not in on the plan until later. And it I think things could have been handled a little bit better there. Two is if you don't read Catwoman issue number 19, you, you, you'll you probably be a little lost on what's going on with her infiltrating uh, Arkham Asylum. And lastly, I felt as though the Martian Manhunter back, so though fun and interesting and enjoyable, um, is no connection to the previous Martian Manhunter story. Uh, oh, and this is also a uh, gatefold cover, the last one, I think, which is Catwoman attacking the Justice League. Uh, good, bad, whether or not you should... Oh, no, I already did that. Whether or not you should get it. Um, on a whole, I would give this a... I'll give this a 4 out of 5. Like the team, like the dialogue, like everything. I just felt as though things could have been mapped out a little bit better. 
Uh, but besides that, it's a good issue, and Justice League of America is a comic that I do recommend people pick out. Okay. Kind of a short week, don't you think? Uh, on to my Andrew Cutter picks of the week. Let me pull them out. One, two, three. And it's actually going to be in this order. Uh, number three is Suicide Squad. Uh, the team is just so badass in this and how they're psychologically being analyzed. The shocker at the end was really good. Just on a whole, everything was handled in this issue really fun. And I'm interested to see where this team goes. Love the addition of the Unknown Soldier. Coming in at number two is um, Deathstroke the Terminator. Great finale for the Deathstroke comic. Sets the pace of what Deathstroke and some of his supporting cast will be for now on, even though he's no longer going to have a comic. And uh, just overall, so emotional. So emotional. Uh, and speaks volumes to who Deathstroke is. But my Andrew kind of pick of the week, the number one, would go to Threshold, the Haunted issue, uh, Hunted, issue number five. Um, just a fantastic issue. Uh, really something that I recommend people pick up. It's kind of a... Um, comic that has that freedom to do whatever it wants and it just does whatever it wants so pick it up threshold my Andrew kind of pick of the week um so that is the comics for this week we will put these right call and i just got a text message don't know who from my buddy he's an idiot it's the one that gets all the the digital downloads of batman and i've just uh he wants the code again because it didn't work uh, as for video games, uh, I finally beat Pandora's Tower for the Wii. Uh, this has to be one of the best Wii games that I've played in a very long time, if not one of the best Wii games. Uh, it's a nice swan song for the Wii, seeing that it's pretty much one of the last games that's going to be released for the Wii. But most importantly, I'm going to turn off this light here, I don't need it. Um, most importantly is it was just very well done. It was so different from all other Wii games. Uh, I really like the time management, the combat, the characters, the story, uh, everything that was being handled in this. Um, it's something that I recommend people pick up. And it, it's a long game, but it's a fun game. And now that I beat it, I have all these casual games that I can play. Red Seal, Red Seal 2, Batman Legos, uh, 2 Superheroes, Castlevania. Uh, what is it? Uh, Castlevania. The one for the Wii. I forget what it's called. Castlevania something. Uh, not Judgment. Is it Judgment? No, it is Judgment. Um, and then what else did I get? Uh, Punch-Out, a couple of other things, but these are all casual games. Uh, House of the Dead 1 and 2, uh, 2 and 3 revisited. But it, it's kind of cool that, uh, I beat this game, and now I can go into a little bit more relaxing games. And I know a lot of you are thinking, why did you get Red Seal? It sucks. It was $2. And, yeah, it's atrocious by today's standard, but it does have some charm. It still kind of sucks, but it has some charm. Um, and I beat Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, finally. Fun game. Not my favorite Fire Emblem, but it's still uh, a fun game. Um, and before I get into uh, Shin Megami Tensei and uh, Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, I want to kind of detox like I'm doing with my Wii games. I'm detoxing. I'm playing a, a, the Mario sports games. I'm detoxing with Mario Tennis uh, Open. So playing this enjoy so far not quite as good as the original mario tennis but still pretty fun uh so yes now we'll jump into questions and answers that's basically the deal with video games what's going on now uh what else is happening in life oh you won't be able to see it because my clothes are covering it i got the new uh green lantern simon baz figure i will be reviewing it tomorrow but I'm going to pause the video here, and then I'm going to go into question and answers. Okay, moving on. Uh, actually, before we move on, two two things. Uh, the new new DLC character for Injustice was revealed, Batgirl. I look forward to playing her. And also, Grant Morrison's Wonder Woman Earth 1 was revealed. It's going to be fun and interesting. Uh, but I just want to throw those two out there because I completely forgot about them. I'm really pumped for Earth 1 Wonder Woman uh, because... I really want to see Grant Morrison's take on the character. As for uh, Batgirl DLC, uh, she looks like she plays really good, so I want to give her a chance. I want to give her a good chance and see how good she really is as a character. Uh, but yes, on to questions, answers, and comments. Basically, this is how it works. 
Um, you can comment in this video, and it doesn't matter if it's question, comment, question, comment, question, comment. doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I will respond to it, and I will either answer the question or respond to the comment. Uh, so, first and foremost is Chris Ferguson, uh, and I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, said, Do not read Avengers or Iron Man. Neither are very good. X-Men is so much better right now. Pretty much any big series is good. It just depends on what you like. All new X-Men revolves around the original five X-Men in Jean Grey School. Uncanny X-Men revolves around Cyclops and his group of uh, revolutions. Wolverine and the X-Men is about Jean Grey School and the kids attending it. Uh, attending school too. X Men not out yet, but Brian Wood and Oliver Copiel uh, and an all new team. Uh, you know, I kind of want to read the X Men titles, but I just kind of don't care. I used to love X Men, but I felt as though they just become so convoluted, and there's just so many titles. Uh, I mean, again, people will pull up the argument. Yeah, but there's like four Batman titles, along as all the additional Batman titles. Yeah, that's true, but. I like Batman. X-Men, I'm kind of mad on. Uh, I actually want to do another video, seeing that I started reading comics. I want to do a video, again, giving, if I could reboot the Marvel Universe, how would I do it? Because I do it a little differently now. So, uh, I do have that that I want to do again. If you guys want to see it, let me know. Uh, but I'm going to continue reading Avengers and Iron Man, at least for now, because, like I said, I feel as though they're... Avengers, I, I, it feels like the Justice League of this... Marvel Universe, so I want to see how it compares to Justice League, and Iron Man, because he's considered one of the trinity of Marvel. Blue Lantern of 2814, I'm just going to call you Blue Lantern for now on. Uh, at what point in the pre-Flashpoint Justice League of America comic did Dick start being Batman? Just wondering where to put it on my shelf related to Final Crisis. Uh, it happened after Final Crisis. Dick started becoming Batman in Justice League, started leading it on James Robinson's run, which I believe was Team's History, the trade, or the graphic novel. I am Super Batman 1993. Have you seen all the Christopher Nolan movies? And if so, what are your thoughts on the ones you have seen? I think the only Christopher Nolan movies I've seen are the Batman ones. I want to see Inception, but my fiance and I have tons of movies we want to see. We just haven't been able to get to them. Um, however... And sorry for going off screen here. However, uh, I do want to see Inception, and I am pumped for the new Superman movie coming out. So, moving on. Uh, I, Textric, I believe that's how you say it. Uh, I feel the same way about Marvel Comics right now. I only pick up Ultimate Superman, uh, Spider-Man, and I mostly stick with Image and DC. Then you or I are in agreement. Uh, because... I, there's not much from Marvel I really like. I like Thor, I like Captain America, and I like the Fantastic Four. Everything else is kind of just there. Uh, do I read S uh, Saga? No, I don't. I know everyone wants me to. Everyone thinks I should. Um, it's just I'd rather get in individual issues, and the individual issues are mad impossible to find now. Eric Boyer, uh, agree with you on the Marvel Trinity. Thank you. Uh, Dan, some 80, you should check out Nova and Guardians of the Galaxy. They just started and they're easy to get into the first two or three issues. Yes, I understand that, but here's the thing. I don't like Nova. I never really did. And, um, Guardians of the Galaxy, I just have no need to get them. I was tempted to pick, uh, get all the issues for the current Daredevil run because everyone's telling me to get them. I just can't find them. And, uh, same with Hawkeye. I just can't find them. So, I try, guys, but if I don't have them, I can't read them. Uh, Therior38, to answer your question, I've been reading all the Wonder Woman books in your timeline. I uh, just wanted to say thanks for getting me back on track on what trades are in continuity. No problem, and I'm glad that you're reading Wonder Woman. She's a stand-up character. Nick Lenz, what's up, Nick? Hey, Andrew, two questions for you. First, do you think Jonah Hex should get his own solo title uh, and put it alongside All-Star Western like Batman and Detective Comics and Superman Action Comics? Um, I don't think he needs it. I, I love Jonah Hex and I love All-Star Western. I just don't think he's a popular enough character to warrant another comic from him. And I think uh, All-Star Western does enough for him. Uh, and uh, I would love to have another Jonah Hex comic. I just think people won't 
buy it. That's the thing. Uh, one of the two comics will su uh, suffer. Second, what should be done with Captain Adam since he, uh, it has been almost a year since his solo title has been canceled? Uh, he's made a few guest appearances on Firestorm, Fury of Firestorm. What do I think should be done with him? I wouldn't mind seeing him in the Justice League of America or the Justice League. Um, he's a Justice League character. He should be a Justice League character and he should be on one of those teams. He, he's not a solo comic kind of guy. He is a team member. There's certain characters that work well on teams and there's certain characters that work well on uh, solo series and there's characters that can do both. Uh, I think in all honesty, uh, with the exception of the, I mean, I think in all honesty, even though his comic was fun and very high concept and good and I really did like uh, what was done in his comic and appreciate it, uh, JT Kroll, uh, I do really think that Captain Adam is more of a team-up character. Uh, second question, what should be, oh no, that was the second question. Zach Brown. Hey, Andrew. Uh, in one of your videos, you were asked how long you could last in a fight with Batman. Twice, actually. Um, my question is, how long would you last in a fight with Bane? And no, not the Batman and Robin Bane, because that wasn't even Bane. It was a joke. Lol. Uh, against Bane. Uh, uh, that, that, that's such a loaded question. What is around me? Because with Bane, uh, is he on Venom or is he not on Venom? Because there's two kinds of Banes. There is the Chuck Dixon after Nightfall Bane, which is off Venom. And then there's after Chuck Dixon Bane, which is always on Venom. If it's Bane off Venom, uh, if I have enough stuff I can throw at him, maybe I can run away like a pansy. Because uh, it's Bane. Uh, no, to be all honest, how long would I last in a fight against Bane? 45 seconds? Because it's Bane, the man that can defeat Batman. Uh, and I'm not knocking my own fighting skills. I'm just saying, as a fictional character, Bane can beat Batman. He is freaking huge, and he's intelligent. Uh, Bane would be unstoppable. The best I can do is run away from Bane and survive. So, if I'm in an alleyway with Bane, maybe I can throw something at him and distract him long enough to get the hell out of there. I'm sure he would probably track me down. This is not just me. Take any of the greatest martial artists in the world. Bill Superfoot Wallace to... I don't know. The Iceman Chuck Liddell to... Uh, anyone. Bruce Lee. I mean, they're not going to do well against Bane. Because he's a fictional character that's given fictional character abilities. So, there you go. Bane. 45 seconds at most. Probably because Bane would be very slow with me. Uh, Lester, or Enrique Mendian. Um, Andrew, since you, have, since you have her comic, does that mean Jade is still around? Uh, Jade is not around. Jade is only in the Anime Con universe. I asked because I want to have Obsidian as well in the DC universe. Um... James Robinson said in one of his Comic Vine podcasts that he's trying to work Jade and Obsidian into Earth 2. He just doesn't know how he's going to do it, but he will. I uh, don't know much about the character, but still really interests me. Plus, I find uh, I find really stupid DC decides to turn Alan Scott gay when they're, uh, when they're, uh, when they're you have a gay character as a son. I don't think it's uh, stupid. I think it's just DC trying to do a market ploy. Um, however, here's the thing about Alan Scott turning gay. It's being done well. Uh, James Robinson had done a fantastic job about it. It's not just for shock value. He's actually making an incredible character who just happens to be gay. It's not a gay character in comic books. It's just a comic book character that happens to be gay. Um, and he's doing a fantastic job of it. Uh, yes, Obsidian was gay. And it's going to be interesting how they're going to fit that into the mold. But, I mean, it's going to, something like that is about to happen and kind of mess with how you're going to make the characters. Because a lot of people could say, well, you're, you're turning this straight father who has a gay son gay. How is that? I mean, how do you make that work? But at the same time, Obsidian doesn't exist on Earth 2 yet. So he's not, he can't, I don't think unless he adopts children or unless he, um... 
artificially inseminates a woman or if he decides to somehow uh i don't know how there's multiple different options that a uh homosexual cus uh, couple can have to have children uh, however if he is not interested in being with women how is he going to procreate with a woman uh, except for artificial insemination actually that would be an interesting question uh, to any of you comic book readers out there, or any people that watch my vid uh, videos, uh, who are in a homosexual relationship um, and want to have children in the future, how are you going to go about it? Uh, would you adopt? Would you artificially inseminate? Would you have someone have your child for you? Uh, or, I mean, I I'm, I'm interested because I do have some gay friends out there, but none of them want children. So this issue never came up. But it's going to be interesting how that would work with uh, Alan Scott. If he was, if Jade and, and Obsidian were going to be his children, would they be adopted? Would they be related to him somehow? I don't know. It's an interesting question. Uh, so if if you are in that situation, if you uh, are in a homosexual relationship and you want to have children, how are you going to go about it? I'm interested. Uh, please comment by all means or video respond. Um, review Ultimate One. Did you read Grace Randolpho's? Sir, uh, super buy, uh, buy No, I never heard of it. Please tell me what it's about. Uh, George Jones, two uh, main two Batman writers of recent years being Grant Morrison and Scott Snyder. Which one do you prefer? P.S. I live in the U.K. and got into comics about three years ago after discovering your channel. Now I have about sixty trade paperbacks and hardcovers. I love comics. Cheers. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad that you have got into comics. Out of the two, I have to say Scott Snyder. I like better. Than Grant Morrison is a hit and a miss. Uh, when Grant Morrison does well, boy, does he do well. He does fantastic. Uh, Grant Morrison, also, when he does bad, boy, does he do bad. Uh, Scott Snyder, on the hand, I feel is very consistent in how good he is. So I do like Scott Snyder more, and I feel as though he has a handle of the person of Batman better, uh, where Grant Morrison does have a handle of the character or the concept of Batman very well. Batman Beyond for the win. What's your favorite uh, Tarantino movie besides, uh, besides Pulp Fiction? Actually, Pulp Fiction is not my favorite um, Tarantino movie. Um, it's probably my third favorite. I like Reservoir Dogs maybe a little bit more. And uh, I think my favorite, although incredibly flawed, I love the Kill Bill movies. I really do. They're very flawed, uh, especially how things get chopped up and how the... The story is broken up into pieces, but I really do like the Quentin Tarantino's um, Kill Bill. Randim, Remdi, uh, Rad D Damis, uh, Taurus, am I pronouncing that correct? If I am, please, by uh, all means, help me, because I'm horrible at pronunciation. Hey, Andrew, you gotta read Hawkeye by my fraction. I know I do. Like I said, I just need the issues. Oscar Otunger, hey Andrew Cutter, who would win a fight between the Justice League, Justice League America, and Justice League Dark? Can you give me facts? I don't know if the question is stupid. Uh, please, can you answer? Thanks for reading this. Uh, here's the ultimate thing. In the fight between the three, um, I would say Justice League, and this is why. Yes, Justice League of America has heavy hitters like Martian Manhunter, who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superman. And um, Justice League Dark has powerful people like Constantine or Zatanna. Although Zatanna, I think, is going to be joining the Justice League, so count her out. Uh, but uh, even Madame Zandu, they, all of them have powerful members. But here's a the kicker. They have a few powerful members. The Justice League has powerful members across the board, like Uber members from Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, uh, Aquaman, Cyborg... All of them are incredibly powerful on their own. And then you have the mastermind behind it, Batman, the strategist. Um, how can you stop that team? Really? How can you? Um, and a lot of people would say, well, Martian Manhunter's a telepath, and, and he's the most powerful telepath he is. Uh, there is. Yeah, it's true. Martian Manhunter is a credible telepath, the most powerful one. I would even say he's more powerful than many of the other telepaths in comic books. Say, dear, I dare say more powerful than Jean Grey or Phoenix. But that's personal opinion. Uh, people can argue that. That's fine. But here's the thing. Superman, uh, although susceptible to telepathic attacks, has incredibly high resistance to it, too. Um, 
Green Lantern, if Hal wasn't in this fight too, uh, his willpower would be able to hold back. Uh, we've seen Martian Man have to take on Flash. If Flash thinks fast enough, he can avoid that. And uh, Batman has substantial training against telepathic attack. And you also have to think of this. Uh, Aquaman is a pretty... He's a telepath in his own right, in some way, shape, or form. He communicates uh, marine life. He would be able to have some barriers. Uh, the only ones that I think would be susceptible to him is Cyborg and Wonder Woman. I'm pretty sure they both have enough willpower that they can at least hold back Martian Manhunter. Where something like a psychic attack wouldn't be enough to take down the members. He would have to get physical. Which, by all means, he would be able to get physical with them. But uh, Martian Manhunter, I think, is outclassed physically by Superman, he would need to catch a Flash, and I think Wonder Woman would be able to hold their own. And I think the Justice League as a team is a more well-oiled team. They have been with each other longer. They understand each other. Um, Batman as a leader of the team. If you look at the teams, Batman's the leader of the Justice League. Uh, you can very well say Martian Manhunter is the field commander. I'm not going to count Steve Trevor. Uh, is the field commander uh, commander of Justice League of America. And Constantine is the de facto leader of um, the Justice League Dark. And despite how good, charismatic of the leaders they are, Batman is just a far more intelligent uh, leader. I could just see a fight between them. Know how the Justice League of America was set up as a opposing force to the Justice League? How they had Martian Manhunter versus Superman and Vibe versus Flash and Wonder Woman versus Katana. I could just see Batman say, Okay, listen up. I'm not going to do the Batman voice. I'm horrible at it. Okay, listen up. Let's see. Obviously, they're going to have Martian Manhunter attack Superman. So, Superman, don't fight Martian Manhunter. Take out that Green Lantern. And Green Lantern, go after Martian Manhunter. Okay, so Vibe is attacking Flash and could screw with Flash's powers. Interesting. Okay, how about instead we have Cyborg jump on Vibe while Flash goes after Hawkman and Green Arrow and Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman, you can take on Katana, but how about you take down Stargirl and leave Katana to me because I know how to fight Katana. I've done it before. Something like that. I think Batman would know how to mix it up with the team. Uh, so yes, uh, I think the Justice League would win for those reasons. Excellent question. A lot of good questions today, guys. I'll give you uh, props. Uh, Super and Fantatico um, asks, Andrew, uh, Gabriel uh, Romero here. Man, thanks for answering my questions of Deadpool and Deathstroke. Now I have another question. Would you recommend me and some friends of my same age, 16, to make a blog of comics, movie, music opinions? Thank you if you read this. Um... I absolutely recommend anyone do a blog for anything uh, to express yourself in your opinions. Now, if I'm going to be realistic and honest here, and um, don't take this as anything negative, I'm just giving a factual criticism. Um, a lot of people have trouble uh, taking younger individuals seriously when they do blogs or vlogs. Uh, it's a unfortunate stigma that people get. Uh, I don't know why, but they, they just find it a little bit harder. Uh, but uh, if you can get over that hump of people's discrimination of you being younger and doing a vlog, uh, I absolutely recommend it. And what I do recommend is you do something different. Make yourself stand out. You have millions of people doing the same thing you're doing. Uh, spice it up. Try to make something different in order for your blog to stand out. But I have faith in you. And uh, the best of luck. And if you need any advice or anything, there's hundreds of people that are willing to help you out. Um, I, I would absolutely be willing to help you out. My I believe everyone on my channel and all the comic book fans out there, uh, we're all one big community. We'll be more than happy to help anyone in our community. And the wind is blowing. I think a storm's coming. Moving on, Zach Brown. I bet they will bring Damien back, and it will probably be like when they killed off Jason Todd and brought him back. And by the way, Damien is my least favorite Robin. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Damien comes back. Grant Morrison said he's not bringing him back. Damien's dead in his mind. But he also said if someone brings him back, by all means, go ahead. I think, of course, they're going to bring Damien back at some point. It's just a matter of when. Uh, Akuna Makota Z, what do you think will happen in Trinity War 
Hope you have a great day. Well, thank you. Uh, what do I think will happen in Trinity War? I don't know. Uh, Pandora is obviously going to be the focus of it. Uh, and we know from the interview with Jeff Johns that things will not be resolved. I think that it will be a big fight between the teams. Each of them are going to have their own uh, philosophies or um, opinions on what should happen with Trinity and her golden skull. Uh, the Justice League Dark should probably think it should be uh, destroyed or... or uh, the Justice League of America thinks that it should be locked away and studied, or the Justice League thinks it should be... I don't know. There's going to be a definite, uh, definite uh, opinions, uh, differing opinions. I think what will happen is one of the teams will be more right than the other, and I think it will be the Justice League. If you look at that free comic book day spread, uh, it feels almost like the Justice League is going to be the good guys, but you never know. I think it's just going to be a free-for-all. Um, but the thing about this I like is I know nothing about it, so that makes it even more interesting. Good question. Uh, moving on. The uh, the Joseph Kerr, 86. Hey, Andrew, I really enjoy the most epic bat... Uh, the most... Uh, wait, little, little. Hey, Andrew, I really enjoy like most the epic Batman death of the family arc. And it was supposedly the breaking of the bat. My personal view is the best way to break Batman would to make him think that he killed someone using a gun. And it would have been orchestrated by Hush. Give you knowledge, given your knowledge on Batman, if you were asked us to write a story to break the bat, how would you do it? Also, uh, would you like to see Dr. Hurd or Professor Pig return? Uh... As a comment to your first uh, thing about Batman killing someone using a gun, uh, he actually kind of did that pre-New 52 with the Batman cult story. He was hypnotized or brainwashed into using a gun to kill someone. Although he doesn't quite remember, but uh, he didn't take it well. Um, as for my breaking of the bat story, that's a tough one. Uh, a lot of things can be defined by breaking the bat. And, um... You know, Chuck Dixon did it best with Bane, and Scott Snyder does a good job at analyzing Bruce as a character and breaking his points. Uh, it's tough to kind of break the bat. One thing I would never do is I would never have it involve guns, and I would never have Batman kill anyone. But maybe it's... Yeah, that's a tough question. I'm not sure how I would do it. I know what kind of Batman stories I would tell. Um... I think if I was to break the bat, I would do it in the physical level, similar to how Chuck Dixon would do it. I would involve Lady Shiva in the story, along with Deathstroke or uh, uh, David Kane. I would use the assassins of the DC Universe to do it, um, and then there'd be a mastermind. I think Hush would also be involved, too. Um, if I could write a grand 36-issue Batman run, I would have I have it all planned out. Um, it, and Hush would be a major character in it, too. And I would know how to fix the whole entire Catwoman not knowing Bruce Wayne thing, too. Uh, because Catwoman doesn't know Batman is Bruce Wayne, uh, but I know how it would get around that. Um, but I think it would be a physical breakdown, and I think I would have, I would kill off someone to have it happen. Who would I kill off? You might have to ask. Uh, as for Dr. Hurt and Professor Pig, yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing them return, although I would always like to see Dr. Hurt be used by Grant Morrison. It's his character. Not saying other people wouldn't be able to do him well, I'm just saying it's his character. Uh, Ben's Comics. How many DC titles are you reading? What do you think about Detective Comics in New 52? Is it really essential? Also, how do you think, uh, the regular Superman title is going? Any chances of you wanting or reading Walking Dead? As for the titles in the New 52, I'm reading about everything except for the Legion books, Dial H. I think that's about it. The Legion books and Dial H are the only things I'm not reading of the New 52. As for Detective Comics, is it essential? No. Is it good? Yes. Do I recommend picking it up? Uh, since John Layman comes on, yes, it, definitely. Uh, and how do you think the regular Superman title is going? It's okay. Not great. But it's okay. It is, it's fun. I think that's the factor that comes from it. X Violas. Uh, you pick up anything good for free comic book day. Uh, day and 
you need to pick up and play Legacy of Kane series. I have not got anything for Free Comic Book Day because I was working. And I completely forgot it was Free Comic Book Day. I know. I'm an idiot, but it happens. Uh, as for Legacy of Kane, I have not played it. Uh, I have a lot of games on my table, but you never know. I could play in the future. And the last question, Omar Z. Hey, Andrew, I wanted to ask you what your first comic book that blew your mind and the first comic book that got you into DC. Also, did you really start to appreciate the dialogue of comics? When did you really appreciate the dialogue of comics? The first comic that blew me away. Um, probably Nightfall. I attribute a lot of my comic book reading to Nightfall. But I would probably say Nightfall. Uh, Hush blew me away when I first read it, too. Uh, and that's when I was getting back into comics. And I picked up the Hush. And I had a trade, and I said, whoa, this is really good. So, I, you know... Because the way I read comics is this. I've always been a comic book fan. I read comics when I was younger, but I don't think I quite understood them as much. And then from ages, I want to say, 10 to 16, I really didn't read comics. And then I started to read them again. And I think when I got back into comics full force, when I was, I want to say, 17 or 18, roughly, uh, more towards 18, that's when I really went full force with comics again. I think it was Hush that got me back in the zone, and it did blow me away. I did really like Hush. I know Hush is a flawed story, but it's a beautifully done flawed story. Hey, not everything's going to be perfect, uh, but I really did like Hush. Maybe I should turn this back on. Better? Uh, as for when did I start appreciating uh, dialogue in comics, when I started comparing dialogue in comics to other forms of media, from uh, poems to uh, novels. There was a time when I was probably, oh, early college years, I was heavy into reading novels, and I read a, quite a lot from ages 18 to 20, a lot of novels. Um, and when I compared novel stories to comic book stories, that's where I would appreciate the good things and the bad things from both. So I think that's the best way that I answered the question. Uh, so that is all the comments for today. All the comments. Uh, if you have a question or comment, please, by all means, post it down. Um, and I will be absolutely uh, more than happy to answer or to comment back. Um, and, yes, that's about all I have to say today. I will do a Green Lantern Baz video sometime soon. And that should be up tomorrow. And Oh, and um, I'm pumped because tonight... Uh, my fiance and I are going to go to a comedy show, and we're going to go see uh, Ross Matthews, who is absolutely freaking hilarious. He is great. Um, we we like going to comedy shows. So far, we've seen two of our favorite uh, comedians, probably two of our favorite comedians, period. Uh, we saw Joe Coy, who is my favorite comedian, and then uh, Dimitri Martin, who's her favorite comedian, and we both love them. I, I love Dimitri Martin, and she loves Joe Coy. Um, and then we're going to go see Ross Matthews, who is in my top three favorite comedians of all time. I really do think he's absolutely hilarious. Uh, and I loved him on Chelsea lately. Uh, and then I, I have to say of my top four comedians, it's, and I know not everyone's going to agree with this, but I, I love, um, Dimitri, uh, well, Joe Coy is my favorite, Dimitri Martin then Ross Matthews, and then Daniel Tosh. I would love to see stand-up Daniel Tosh. The thing about Daniel Tosh is he has no filter, and that's hilarious. I also like, uh, like stuff like Ron White and Louis C.K., um, but I I'm pumped for Ross Matthews. And I don't have everything here, and um, maybe I'll try to post a picture up on here. I'm going to I'll see if I can. Um, I have, uh, when we went to go see... Joe Coy, I got some autograph stuff, so I got two autograph things from him, and I have a picture, which I'll try to post up now. See if it works. If it didn't, sorry. And then when we went to go see Dimitri Martin, I bought one of his books, and I got an autograph. I don't have it on hand because I gave it to my fiance, because again, Dimitri Martin's her favorite uh, comedian, and we got a picture with him, which I'll try to post up here.
So uh, Ross Matthews has a, a book out. So I'm going to purchase that when I go see Ross Matthews. And I'm going to get that autograph. And I'm going to get a picture of, uh, with him. And I'm, I'm pumped. I love comedy shows. So uh, hopefully it, it's, it's kind of like I equate going to comedy shows and meeting these people as to getting autographs. Like uh, Frank Whiteley, Jim Lee, and uh, Neil Adams I have up there. Uh, I've I got some pretty big people there. And I have to say, out of artists, I've got uh, my favorite artist of all time, Jim Lee's autograph on Batman Hush. That's freaking awesome. Um, and I would love to meet him again. And if I met Jim Lee again, I would get my Batman issue number two and issue number one of the New 52 signed by him. Even though he didn't do anything on issue number one, I still get a sign. And my Justice League issue number one signed by him. But, however... Um, my other favorite artist I would love to meet is uh, is uh, George Perez. Uh, and there's also Tony Daniel and Kenneth Rockford. And there's a bunch of artists I would love to meet. But I feel as though I've met a lot of my favorite comedians more than I've met my favorite artists. So uh, it's kind of like after I meet Ross Matthews, I'm going to say, well, the only ones left for me to really meet that I really, really want to meet is Daniel Tosh. And even then, I've got the big three on my list. Daniel Tosh is just kind of gravy on the list so i'm glad i got uh the uh got to meet joe coy joe coy is an awesomely nice guy he is so nice and i'll tell you a story about joe coy i'm gonna go off for a bit um when we met joe coy uh we asked him uh in the crowd uh could you do something to uh say hi to us on um chelsea lately and uh and i don't like chelsea lately too much i just like some of the comedians out there uh, my fiance likes her a little bit more than I do. But uh, he said, okay, I'll give you guys a wink when I'm on Chelsea lately. Uh, and that's going to be this coming Tuesday. So this coming Tuesday, we watched it, and we're like, he's not going to do it. And they go, and Joe Coy. And he goes like this. And everyone's like, what was that? He's like, you know what it was. Uh, and it was great. He actually sent a shout out to us. But uh, we met up with him, and we got to take our picture with him and talk to him. And he was the nicest guy in the world. I've heard comedians can be dicks. He was really nice. And uh, Dimitri Martin was hilarious, too. And I, I talked to Dimitri Martin. I had to thank him because uh, Dimitri Martin, although I like Joe Coy a little bit more, Dimitri Martin did my favorite uh, joke of all time, which is um, the the treehouse joke. Look it up online. It's really funny. It, it's a short joke, but it's a very hilarious one. And I sat to, I talked to him. I said, dude, I got to tell you, you created my favorite joke. He's like, yeah, I know. That joke is awesome, but I can't use it anymore because I used it too much. I'm like, yeah, but I still, you should use it. It's awesome. And my fiance was like, we really love you. We met, uh, we know, uh, we've been watching you since this special and all that. And uh, he got, uh, he, he said hi to us and everything. He was really nice too. Uh, so I'm pumped for tonight. Sorry, I went off on a little tangent, but hey, shit happens. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to end this video here. Uh, this is Andrew saying peace out for now.